with the Indian Air Force and overseas assignment in the Middle East and involved with two startups in the primary care sector. He is presently working as a consultant, medical director with Practo, chief medical officer at RxDx Healthcare and consultant with Unilever Industries. Passionate about primary care and teleconsultation, including the digital space. Let me pass the mic to you, Dr. Bellyapa. Doctor, the stage is all yours now. Thank you, Dr. Anju. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. I hope over the next 15, 20 minutes, I will be able to convey some information which will be of help and which will help you in your practice and make you a better doctor. So you all must be aware that patient safety is a big thing and we all talk about and this whole, we've had a number of lectures over patient safety. So this is some of the basic things that I would like to share with you, some guidelines and also the practical experience. So these are the various modalities of digital and telehealth delivery. We know most of them. And we are in the uh, e-consultation space along with video consultation. And we have other things like remote patient monitoring and messaging provided to provide consultation and in-person visit too. The most important thing that people are aware and very wary about is data. So it's very important for us to protect the patient data. At Practo, we ensure that all the data is protected. We have a data grievance officer who will look into all these matters. And we follow all the legal and ethical obligations as laid on by the government of India. The video conferencing is secure and we are HIPAA compliant. This is basically a act for healthcare people. And if there's any data breach, we, we are quick to bounce on it and clear it as quickly as possible. And we train our staff in the important aspects of data security. So data, many people are very wary that the data is taken and it may not be used for property. All that is not correct. We maintain it. The data is totally the patient's data and it doesn't go anywhere else. And we are, we follow the compliances to make sure that everything is followed to the team. Now, this is a very important term. First, do no harm. I think many other people would have used this over the past month or so. Primum non nocere. It's a saying by Hippocrates. So when we have to practice, we have to be very careful, whether it's online or offline or anything else. We, we make sure that we don't do any harm to the patient. From a patient perspective, to ensure that the patient is able to the identity is correct, so there's no misdiagnosis and no unauthorized access. Informed consent. Generally, when they take consent, they would, the terms and conditions would say, I would do agree. So that means implied. But then we also we have to, uh, that's an implicit form, but we also have to say explicit, are you ready for consultation when we, when we uh, speak to the patient? We have to make sure that confidentiality is maintained. The communication has to be clear, both through video or through audio or through written. And if there's any situation, the protocol would be to refer the patient to the concerned hospital or other, other facility which so desires that the condition would be. Documentation and follow-up is always very important in healthcare, and we need to keep the record keeping as well as the follow-up care. So all this is applicable to the patient too. Now, sometimes we see that the patient's the behavior may be abusive. So, and there, there are some instances where the doctors have told us that the, there's some experience of sexual misconduct or they're inappropriately attired or some other acts. So these are very challenges, challenging conditions for us because in a telemedicine consultation the patient may be somewhere else the doctor will be somewhere else so there is they feel that nobody is watching them and then there might be a certain number of people who might you know may not talk appropriate appropriately so it's important that we ensure that the patients are told that you know the, the proper behavior is required 
And if they are very abusive, from a practical perspective, we have the we can take the decision to block out the patient. Or if something else is there, if the doctor so desires, we can share the data of the transaction, be it audio, video, or the prescription, to defend whoever so desires, provided the channel is from the right legal background. So we have a lot of challenges. The strategies, strategies which we have to mitigate these are to educate both the patient as well as the doctor and to put checks and balances in place. Audio, video, the two way is the best communication. That is, you do an audio, speak, see them, speak to them, and give the prescription based on that. However, there might be some technical issues. We know the big problem in India, digital divide, though most of the uh, big cities, there's no problem about uh, the connectivity. The rural hinterland, there might be some connectivity issues. And these came out uh, very well during the COVID time. Like I had some patients during COVID, they like they had to go, to, go up onto the roof and do a teleconsult because they could not uh, get the proper connections. Only at, from a higher level, they could get the uh, connections. So these all we came, came to know only after COVID, which was not there earlier. So there's a huge digital divide. But it's important to have good uh, technology, make sure the technical issues are all solved so that the consult between the patient and the doctor is uh, conducive to a good telemedicine cons consultation. From a doctor's safety, the same points are important. We have to ensure we are talking to the right patient. Sometimes the patient may not be consulting for themselves. They might consult for somebody else, or they would have taken the consultation for their father or mother or sibling, etc. So that should be followed. Again, inf informed consent and privacy is done. We have to make sure the confidentiality is maintained. And we have to be very clear in our communication. And in case you're not able to manage the case, it would be better to refer the patient. Or sometimes you might get the wrong, it might be the wrong specialist, and it's not your specialty. It's better to cancel the consultation and they get back to the practo, uh, you know, the point of contact to find out which doctor they need to see. Documentation and follow up is, is mandatory. We need to document whatever we see and uh, record keeping and also follow up care because patients may again touch base with you with sms to find out uh, you know following the consultation what needs to be done so some of the diagnostic points which we we we, we found it's very important to take the history taking and to inform the patient that there's a physical examination limitation so this is a limitation of telemedicine so if they involve physical examination, it would be better to refer them to a hospital or to their doctor. Sometimes the reliance on inf information by patient at attendance may not be correct. This was happening in COVID. We had to you know, depend on the patient's attendance to check the pulse, the oxygen, the blood pressure. So whatever they said, and sometimes they would say oxygen very low, then we say rub the finger, put the pulse oximeter again, and then things would be different. So we have to train the patient attenders too. In telemedicine, sometimes the information, they would come out with more information than face to face. So that's a very big plus point in telemedicine, especially in the fields of uh, psychiatry, psychology, sexual medicine, and certain uh, obstetrics and gynecology issues. Mental and behavioral issues are well, uh, well, uh, Sort of they are well accepted and people don't mind sharing their issues online compared to maybe when they come and meet the doctor in person and the quality of medical reconciliation we should know what is the quality and we should tell them what we can do what we cannot do and if you're not able to do the escalation of care at all times we need to be safe rather than sorry whether it is online or whether it's offline 
some of the big pluses that we have seen on telemedicine consultation is uh, sugars have got better with a uh, with a online doing teleconsultations and uh, using the help of counselors and uh, dietitians and nutritionists we find that the and telling them what to eat and monitoring them that the glucose monitoring is much better the the numbers are much better so this is one big big advantage we have seen in telemedicine come back to online where we would see the patient and the patient may go and there's no contact but if you have a chronic care group of doctors with glucose monitoring you can tell the patient what you're eating this is what happens if you eat sugar your sugars can go up and if you don't eat sugars it's restricted to proteins sugars may not go up so the objectivity is very well appreciated by the patients so these evidence based practical implications when given to the patients that the compliance is better and the the care the overall care is much better so this has been a big advantage which we have seen medication medication safety this is a separate topic i wanted to discuss please write down the prescription please explain the prescription please double check please ensure that there are no allergies and the correct dose the route and days and etc everything is all uh, written down clearly and there are certain drugs you cannot write like schedule x drugs cannot be written so stick to the telemedicine guidelines which i'm sure all of you must have read if you're not read please again read it it's it's a very uh, good document and very well uh, written it was uh, started when covid started and from there that has been the guideline which we go, we all follow both from a medical medical perspective as well as from a legal perspective so it's important that we follow the medication safe, safety now coming to the doctor behavior there have been instances when doctors have been abusive they have used some language is not uh, politically correct so what we do is we would train them we would block them out if we find that they were uh, you know not uh, following the protocol as per the laid on medical guidelines there are challenges because again the doctor may feel that online you know so it may not be very it's not like when you are sitting in a clinic so this is a strategy we have to train the doctors we have to retrain the doctors and tell them the best practices so these are some of the things as a doctor also we need to be very careful whether we are online or offline especially in today's era workforce fatigue this is very important uh, we need to decide how much we can do because during the peak in the delta when the delta delta virus was the delta variant was there there was a huge workload and we all of us i think everybody was working online offline seeing 80 to 100 100 plus consultation a very high workload that can lead to errors and that can in turn compromise patient safety so you need to decide how many patients you could see at what hours and whether it is affecting your fatigue so the work life balance should not be affected because that can compromise the safety of the patient so it's a very big uh, topic and we need to be very cautious and we need to be very careful about this some of the things which we can fight workforce fatigue is to exercise every day meditate 10 to 15 minutes and uh, naps a nap is very important i myself personally take a nap in the afternoon i learned from the japanese 10 15 minutes and it can really help to improve your productivity so i really uh, would suggest a good nap in the afternoon not too long 10 15 minutes So these are the checks and balances that we we uh, put in place. Uh, we have a medical legal uh, report when we see about 40 to 60 uh, reports per day. The doctor would see, it, we would check, and then we would uh, discuss with the legal team, and then based on that we would decide what to do, and we we would uh, look at uh, social media escalations, including Twitter. complaints from patients complaints from doctors everything is analyzed and we have a very strong and robust team to look into all the reports which come our way safety culture on an on a uh, on a, a day to day basis our doctors are training the doctors on the platform to ensure that they follow the best practices and they don't take any risk and they we train them and we tell them what needs to be done so we follow high level of safety in the organization 
So these are the medical audits that we do. We, we do random audits. We would analyze the data. That is the consultation between the doctor and the patient. And if there are anything out of out of range, we would connect con contact the doctor. And then patients would get back. They're not happy with the treatment. We will again analyze the data. So there are various. We have we, we do on an average. We would do about uh, maybe 100 uh, medical audits a day. And based on that, the the medical team would uh, train and retrain the doctors and suggest recommendations. Initially, when doctors join the uh, practical platform, they're also given some best practices, including the telemedicine guidelines. And they are told what to do and what not to do. And the do's and don'ts of telemedicine guidelines are shared with them. So what is the way forward to ensure that uh, access in telemedicine is maintained and uh, the telemedicine is remains as a good platform and people use this for years to come like anything r d is very important so we do research and innovation for that we need to have good technology good video good audio should have we should have quick uh, the electronic medical record should be able to be easily done so that we can you know interact with many patients and the prescription is given to the patients Sanitization across all platforms is what we look at so that we follow the same guidelines and protocols across the various uh, platforms. We look at education and training. We try to train our doctors on a regular basis, uh, educating in them and also giving them proper training on a regular basis. Patient empowerment, we would tell them how to use the systems better and to ensure that uh, they are comfortable and also to the success stories of telemedicine, namely chronic care is one of the things. And also the advantage of uh, telemedicine is that you can do it anywhere. So you have patients from all over India contacting our doctors to get in touch with the doctors when they're on holiday or in the case of an emergency or various other situations. And they can do it sitting at from their home and they can do it. So that's a big advantage. So should, we should encourage the patients to use it. But we also need to tell them the limitations that uh, sometimes you need to go to the doctor to, for the doctor to examine your chest and look at your parameters, which telemedicine may not be able to do in totality. In terms of the regulatory framework, we are working with um, various bodies and uh, we follow the rules and regulations with the National Medical Medical Commission and all of the previous bodies. We were following with them and we follow all the guidelines and what, what are regulations as laid down. And we, so the same thing is passed on to our, uh, to our customers, which is basically the doctors who are working on the platform. So the take home message would be right care to the right patient at the right time. So it's in the end, it's not all about technology. It's about the it's about the person, how you are able to manage the whole telemedicine concept. It will depend on the doctor to a large extent. Thank you very much. If there are any questions or any observations, please I will look forward to sharing them. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellepa, for this amazing session. Uh, Dr. Abjit, you had a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Dr. Bellepa, sir. Uh, see, uh, health is a state subject. And most of us who are doctors are registered with one state or the other in terms of our medical uh, registration of our degrees. Uh, and telemedicine takes us across uh, borders, state borders. Now, say, for example, sitting in Bangalore, a doctor is doing a teleconsultation for a Northeast patient. And there is something which has gone wrong in terms of the patient has taken the medication as per the uh, prescription of the doctor. And it has resulted in some kind of an adverse event or adverse outcome. Uh, how will that be dealt with? Because generally what happens is there is an escalation 
uh, with the state medical council provided the delivery of healthcare has happened within the state and the patient is uh, patient can uh, file or can appeal to the medical council uh, of the state uh, wherein a board is formed and the doctor is kind of called up for uh, interrogation and things like that but in case of uh, uh, such a cross border or cross state kind of an event uh, how will the uh, thing happen or how will the entire thing be addressed that is what was uh, you know one thing which i was wondering i wanted to ask you sir yeah it is a very uh, very interesting question that you have thrown up and it's a uh, the answers are that most probably the the doctor from the state will probably have to contact his local state and that state will probably have to interact with the uh, with the other state uh, that would be the one way to go the, the state medical councils that would be the best way to go because uh, but, I, but i think one other thing is if you are working in anywhere in india as long as you are uh, you have uh, registered under that state so it should not be a problem so i think if they have there's any issue like that they probably have to speak to the councils this council will have to, have to represent that doctor in the other in the other council for example uh, i i would uh, see for example i have taken uh, insurance uh, medical indemnity insurance so in that medical indemnity insurance i don't have to go to court the legal people will support me wherever uh, whatever happens i don't have to go to court court so maybe in that same way the council will have to represent the doctor since the council has provided uh, registration to that uh, doctor yeah but i think these are the new things which we need to look, look at maybe the national medical uh, commission will uh, be able to solve this and come up with some better guidelines once they are fully operational i hope i've been able to at least yeah, partly uh, answer your question so i believe that the patient has to lodge a complaint to the medical council with which the doctor has got his registrations and certification registered with yes sir absolutely so that is the way maybe to go another question i wanted to ask you sir is uh, see lot of young doctors they uh, get very excited when it comes to you know teleconsultation and they all want to register on this platform they feel uh, you know that in odd hours maybe when they're sitting at leisure they can do a teleconsult or maybe sitting at back of the car when the driver is driving they can finish up couple of consult and earn some money so i was just trying to understand uh, ki uh, of course in practice we have a process so i just wanted you to maybe uh, tell this audience on on how we onboard a doctor and how we train them we have a software wherein they have to take some tests and if they do not pass that we don't onboard it is not all that simple to just straight away Uh, register and maybe onboard so the onboarding process if you could kindly tell the audience of how a doctor can onboard a teleconsult platform would be of value to the audience because many of them ask me ki i also want to you know join teleconsult how to do it uh, get me on board i want to make my profile live and all of that but then there is a uh, it's not all that uh, uh, straight forward so i just wanted you sir to kindly explain to the audience how do we do that also yeah so basically uh, once the doctor is interviewed you have to submit all your documents we have to produce all your documents to ensure that all your documents are uh, in order and uh, and, uh, and and they're all very legal and, they are, and you, are, you can practice that is one to the uh, doctor training team will explain to the doctors what are the best practices what are the elements and guidelines and uh, what else we do in practice from our experience we would share with all our personal experience and based on that after after we allow uh, once we go through the documents we'll make the doctor go live and then we continuously monitor so we are monitoring the doctors we're monitoring the csat everything is important so if the csat is not good we will contact you and say that csat is not good you need to improve and where are your um, shortcomings maybe you you to ask for allergies Uh, write down the history properly explain the drugs all that all that has been done so we constantly continuously monitoring the team the doctor training team will take you through the process of what what all has to be done and then we also would be training and we share some videos and all that of whatever the best practices are thank you sir thank you
thank you for thank wonderful you. Dr. Belipef, few of our viewers have some questions. Is it okay if I ask them to you yeah, now? Yeah, please, please, please. Okay, so okay. one of our doctors had asked, so how do we report an adverse event? Uh, if a patient reports an adverse event, what is the procedure to report it to the PRAC group? Yeah, so then they have to contact the SPOC or uh, the SPOC will put in on the medical legal and adverse event of a drug, correct? Yes, yes. If they are, then then they, have, they have to go to the local doctor to get it uh, uh, check because you can't treat, uh, you may not be able to, if it's very minor, you can probably give antihistamines. Otherwise, you need to, they need to go to the local doctor. Okay. So the next question was, how can we address issue related to patient confidentiality and data security in the age of electronic health records? Yeah, so the patient, uh, the data is totally secure. It's, uh, we have got cyber security. We have a uh, a data officer with uh, totally encrypted uh, 256 bits and we have a link on the Practo website will tell you all the details about the data and the data are not shared with anybody unless of course there is an emergency or a medical legal issue where we will have to share the data otherwise all the data is totally managed i think some article 21 is a legal um, connotation with that everything is looked into and there's no nothing to worry about the data privacy if that's what the question is, I hope I will answer that. So, uh, are there any questions from the audience other than this? If no, we can conclude this session. No, I think there was a hand raised. Oh, sorry. Uh, a question regarding patient feedback. Patient giving negative feedback like faced issue with platforms shouldn't affect uh, be included in Dr. CSAT. No, that will not be included in the Dr. CSAT. We will go through that and then definitely we will. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are very, what shall I say, we look at it very radically. We are not like supporting the patient or supporting the doctor. We will, dis I would say, now we not say radically, I would say dispassionately we look at it and we see. If it's a fault, for example, many patients would say they're not happy with the treatment. We look at it, and if you find that the doctor has followed the best practices and he's done the best that he or she could do, then we will say we do not agree with the patient. But sometimes if the doctor says, no, I did not use uh, these words, and we find that they use the word, then we will have to train and retrain the doctor. So we're actually very fair to both the patient as well as the doctor. Yes, technology we don't give importance to when in the seaside of the pain or the as the patient gives a bad seaside regarding technology. No, it's not concerned. Yes. I think there are no more questions, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. We are waiting forward to hearing you again. So thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session. We'll come back with more interesting topics. Thank you. One second. Uh, I think there's a question. There's a yeah, question. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Can you just see that it disappeared? So Dr. Sujan has asked, uh, wanted to understand the scope of this mode kind of cases suitable for uh, Dr. Sujan, would you want to ask the question in person? Yeah, you can read if you can read it, just uh, please tell us. It's a um, wanted to understand the scope of this mode kind of cases suitable for Patients most of the time are looking for cheap, quick fixes. Follow up, complete treatment is difficult. What is the way out? Sorry, I didn't get the last last few words. I didn't get what was it? Uh, can I take that question? Yeah, please, 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 doctor, please go ahead. Yeah. So what he has asked is uh, uh, the patients. Uh, you know uh, the limitations. I believe uh, he wanted to understand the scope of this mode. And the kind of cases that are suitable, what I was discussing the other day, uh, 
Dr. Sujan, you are right. Actually, uh, I think those cases where a physical examination is of paramount importance, this will not go through. For example, I always tell that an ENT case, for example, where you have to do an otoscopy, a rhinoscopy, or a laryngoscopy, or things like that to understand what is going on inside the cavity. Or for example, if a patient with bleeding PR comes, where you really need to do a, a you know proctoscopy or something to understand whether it is a fissure in NO or whether it is a hemorrhoid or some bead bleeding piles or uh, things like that. So there, this kind of things won't work. Uh, so where it is more based on history, for example, if it is a, a mental health issue, maybe a bit of dermatology involved, uh, where you can maybe point out to a lesion if you can show uh, maybe simple remedies uh, where it is symptomatic, clearly uh, you can overcome them, it's okay. And it's very important for follow-ups. Follow-up means, for example, yeah. Yeah, yeah one yeah, more yeah. thing that's affecting CSAT is not happy with suggested treatment. That, that, that we are always going to into that and we have said that uh, we will look into that and whether we can change that. Yeah, not so happy this, yeah, so this mode is good for follow-up. Like, for example, if the doctor already knows the patient and he has done a surgery on the patient, he has already had a physical encounter before and the history is written elaborately, then it is okay for the doctor to quickly understand and do a follow-up on his medication. Maybe optimize it, tailor the medication, uh, and all of that is easier. So telemedicine, as Dr. Beliappa will also back me up on this, uh, even he himself uh, finds a follow-up patient's much easier to do teleconsult with rather than a patient who's coming for the first time. I think for the first encounter, it is very important that the patient is seen physically from head to toe. And usually the all the dictums of a, a clinical medicine, which is inspection, uh, you know, percussion, palpation, and auscultation, everything should go in through. And then only we should arrive at a, at a conclusion and write the prescription. Uh, telemedicine is okay for a follow for a good follow-up. That is what I can understand. I think Dr. Beliappa can elaborate on this even more. Yeah, see, for example, somebody might do some, you know, basic health checks and they want to discuss with the doctor, that is fine. So like Dr. Abhijit already said, derma is fine. Psychiatry, psychology is fantastic. Uh, sexology, because of the privacy, it's you know, really good. Surgical specialities, like Dr. Abhijit has already highlighted and said, they're a little challenge. But somebody wants to take a second opinion. He want, he's doing a gallbladder surgery. But he wants to take second opinion and he posts the reports. That can be done. Second opinion can be done. So most of our consults are for general practice, some of cold fever, with, with not, not anything dangerous, or for gynecology, some uh, minor things, some little bit of uh, support for pediatrics, some support for obstetrics, a uh, little, little bit of dietetics and uh, dermatology. These are all the top, uh, top contributors to telemedicine. So telemedicine, especially in a country where we are 140 crore people and many, many people, they don't have any doctors. That is where, you know, telemedicine can make a difference. There are no doctors in entire two cities, maybe. It can again make a difference. You don't want to travel too much. Now we are used to Swiggy, we are used to Zomato. Same thing, you can sit in your house and just consult. So it's ease. the ease is there. You're saving money, time and money going. You don't have to wait at a... Uh, doctor's office or clinic, hospital. So those are all the advance, advantage. Of course, a big advantage was COVID, where you know we could not go to see the patients in the hospital because of the transmissibility. So that was it was really wonderful, and we did I think at at the peak we were doing like fifteen thousand consults a day. So there are a lot of advantages. I would say that uh, this is an add-on, which is which is going to empower both doctor and 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 the patient. And it will only improve the overall health umbrella compared to just only being uh, being at the clinic. Yeah, Dr. Abhijit, go ahead. Yeah, so there has been uh, recent uh, uh, a lot of application of telehealth, uh, especially in tele-ICUs, where if most of you would have heard of the uh, company called Cloud Physicians, wherein they put very high-end uh, monitoring device in the ICU, wherein you have a nurse or a basic MBBS doctor who's trained in managing critical care. And a lot of data is transferred from the SPOC to the hub, to the to central monitoring uh, base. And the entire treatment is guided uh, by through inputs and data from different monitors, ventilator, parameters, 
uh, and, and all the invasive data, including syringe pumps and the patient intake output charts. So, so, so that really helps. Even in nowadays, we have tele-ambulances where they do virtual resuscitation uh, with people on ground. So, so there is a lot of implication uh, of all this. And it has even been seen that telemedicine has a very good uh, uh, patient outcome in home care setting. There has been papers and meta-analysis uh, from the Nordic countries, which has which has proved that uh, having a very good uh, uh, visual connect with the patient with a hub and spoke model uh, has resulted in a better outcome of a patient uh, uh, through telemedicine. So there is a lot of scope which is going on uh, and in the future, and also with the event of the uh, various wearable digital device uh, tools and uh, you know wearable devices like glucose monitoring uh, systems uh, and and things like that so so there is a lot of scope for telemedicine to develop into the future where patient themselves participate for patient safety and which is the future now so both the uh, doctors patients and with their participation uh, on this platform uh, the patient safety increases uh, a lot uh, with with uh, with the devices uh, you know getting more sensor enabled inputs so 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 that is what i wanted to yeah uh, very valid point uh, dr which is much appreciated for sharing those information dr sujan nayakar already asked again uh, is there any uh, anything to cultivate patients attitude for this so no use for first consults no like, like i already uh, clarified that you can Use it for first consults, and I explained to you with various uh, categories. I hope you're convinced about that. Yeah. Uh, this one more question: There should be a code of conduct for patients' attendance. Also, sometimes they talk like while lying down on the bed or while eating or without clothes on upper body. How do you proceed in such situations? <laughs> that, that's where that happens. It happens in the clinic also. That's very difficult. It's beyond our uh, scope. We, we can only give guidelines. They read all the terms and conditions and all that. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult. I guess we just have to be good human beings. That's only if you are a good human being, probably then everything will be all right. Yeah, sorry, that I can't, I can't, uh, I can't comment on your question. Sorry. There are no more questions, sir. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all for a patient uh, here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.